back to my YouTube channel, guys. This is going to be my very first ever Q&A on here, and I'm super excited to get into all the juicy stuff you guys asked me about. So I got tons and tons of questions. I can't answer all of them today, but I'm going to try to stick with the ones that people want to know the most. Let's just start out with something really simple. How old am I? I, got, I just turned 31 in April. I got pregnant when I was 28, I believe, and I had the boys when I was 29. I get this question so much, so I'm finally excited to tell you guys how Harry and I met. He is born and raised in Sydney, Australia. I was born in Canada and I was living in Toronto for most of my adult life. Um, he actually moved to Toronto for a one-year contract with his firm. They have an office in Toronto as well. So he signed a contract to go live there for one year and I happened to meet him at the very beginning of that year. So we met on Hinge. Actually, a really funny story how we started dating, but I'll say that for another time. Uh, if anyone's even interested in hearing it. So how did I know Harry was the one? So this is really interesting and I want to just put out there that like, yes, he definitely is the one. And a lot of that has to do with him and who he is and how he approached dating me and all of those things. Um, but I think what's really more important to take on and why he is the one for me had a lot to do with who I was when I met him. Upon reflection, looking back, like what was different about him and what was different about our relationship that made it the one. I had had a lot of experience being in relationships with guys who were definitely not the one. And then right before I met Harry, I had spent the last previous two years being completely single by choice while trying to figure out how to love my life on my own and how to truly, truly, truly have peace being single. I think that has a lot to do with it because I had a ton of experience knowing what wasn't gonna work for me. And then I also fell in love with being on my own and being single. It basically put me in a position that when I met a really amazing guy that actually deserved my love, that that would be the only person I would be willing to risk that peace and that happiness that I was feeling already on my own. Another really important thing that I knew he was the one was because he was the first man who offered me a very healthy love dynamic and I didn't run away. There was no games whatsoever. Like I knew he wanted me. Like, he totally put himself out there. He wasn't trying to, you know, play the typical dating games. He was very, very direct and open and vulnerable at a very early stage. All of those things are really important and a huge reason why Harry is the one and why I was able to ex actually accept him as the one at that time. The biggest piece of advice I have to all of my girlfriends who are still trying to like break out of those cycles of being with the wrong type of people who are attracting, you know, the fuck boys and the douchebags. My biggest piece of advice for all of them is to just stop, like just be alone, learn how to genuinely love your single life, learn how to create a life around you that you love so much that you won't just give it up for just anyone. Find that validation within yourself. And then when you meet someone who's worthy of like adding to your life, then you will be able to like actually accept that person's love. Why am I in Australia? Basically, this is a really easy, simple thing. I lived in Toronto with Harry. Um, he had signed a one year contract to live there and we started dating maybe eight months before that year was up. And he basically gave me the choice. He said, my year contract's coming up. I can either ask to renew the contract for another year and stay here with you or do you want to come back to sydney with me and i just thought it sounded like the greatest adventure of all time were there twins running in your family or your husband's so fun fact the twin genetic does not affect the man in the couple at all so it's only the female's genetics that actually come into play when you're conceiving twins. The female, either she ovulates two eggs, like me, because my boys are fraternal, or her egg split. Men's genetics don't come into play at all. They just give you a little bit of sperm and we do the rest. There was no twins on my side of the family at all, so it was like a complete shock. I didn't even get an ultrasound until 12 weeks because it just wasn't even a thing that I ever considered. Best believe, next time around, I will be absolutely getting that freaking dating scan ultrasound like immediately. <laughs> 
<laughs> so somebody specifically asked this question. Why did you choose a plan C-section and not try vaginally? So I want to preface this with, I'm not trying to influence your decision at all with this, but I will explain my choice and how I got there, what that looked like for me. I remember one of the first thoughts, like truly it was like the third thing that crossed my mind when I found out I was having twins was absolute terror that I was gonna have to have a C-section. I was terrified of that, like truly terrified. Um, I wasn't one of those people that thought that C-section was the easy way out, never thought that. Going into choosing my OB, I, Harry and I literally were like interviewing these OBs and we went into these meetings being like, we're finding someone who will support my choice to have a vaginal birth. I don't want my body to have to go through that intense of a surgery. So I was like really passionate that I wanted to attempt vaginal and I wanted to find an OB who would support that. I started interviewing OBs and I, by the time I got to the second interview, I had completely changed my mind. Once I understood the risks and the statistics and we spoke about like the things that could potentially go wrong, something just clicked in my brain and I said, even if it was 1% more that it would keep my baby safe and get delivered here Earthside with as least trauma as possible, I don't care about my body. I don't care. I don't care how hard the recovery is. I don't care about any of that. Everything just clicked and changed and I was fiercely choosing a plan C section for that reason. This is what was explained to me. And it made a lot of sense. You are pregnant with twins, you grow two babies in your womb and that womb is now the size to fit two babies, right? Even if twin A, that which is the twin that will be delivered first, it's always called twin A, the one closer to the cervix. Even if twin A is in a great position, engaged in your cervix, ready to be born, Potentially what could happen is what the risk is is that you deliver twin a everything goes okay Everything's great. And then all of a sudden Twin B is in a womb that is the size to fit two babies and now there's only one and so it's very like Common that twin B can get into a position or fall into a position or move into a position that is very difficult to get out vaginally without some type of intervention like forceps, a vacuum. Obviously the worst case scenario with twin B is that they get into a position like a, a transverse position of some sort and they cannot deliver the second baby. And there is a chance that you will end up in a emergency cesarean to deliver the second child. Like a lot of twins are delivered vaginally beautifully and healthily every day. It's a risk, it's not a for sure. I just pictured like how traumatic that would be for the babies, for my husband who had to watch that or experience that. Funny, as moms, like we're probably going through the most trauma of all of us, but we don't really even think about ourselves. We think about our loved ones and how it will affect them if something like that happened. It meant a lot to me and my partner that we had a plan. There was something about choosing the plan cesarean that just, I just felt like it just was one variable I could take off the table. I do not regret my decision at all. Both my babies are here healthy and alive. I just don't know why I would regret something that had such a great outcome. But of course I support everyone who wants, for whatever their reasons are, whatever feels in your gut like the right thing to do, like try your best to pursue that, educate yourself and advocate for yourself absolutely this is a question that i absolutely loved and i had to answer it because i don't think i understood this at all going into delivering my baby we hear postpartum depression a lot we hear about it a lot we have a lot of information on it people are talking about it we're prepared to try to try to look for the signs and symptoms of it right but what i never heard about was postpartum anxiety the question was did you have ppd or ppa and the answer is I had intense postpartum anxiety. I don't think I understood it until I look back and reflect. Constantly just telling yourself like, oh, it's just hormonal. It's just, it'll pass. It'll, it's not, you know, I just went through a lot. Like I'll feel better tomorrow. When you're in the middle of that crazy, you know, intense newborn stage with twins, you're not like worrying about yourself and how you're coping. You're just like trying to like, figure out how to keep your babies alive and happy. I'll tell you a little story. I gave birth to the twins. I just had a major abdominal 
surgery and recovering from that. Um, all of a sudden I have two humans on this earth that I love more than anything. Like my heart couldn't handle how much I loved them. It, like that sounds crazy, but it actually felt like I couldn't handle how much I loved them. You know that saying like my heart's bursting out of my chest, not in like a cute, like cartoon way. It was like painful, truly, truly, truly struggling with my heart feeling like I couldn't handle having two things that were outside of my body in this scary world that I loved more than anything and I just want to protect them. My literal body couldn't handle loving them so much and I literally had like panic attack, intense anxiety for the first six months, honestly. I would constantly have panic attack. Remember like on day four and five after giving birth, just like shaking, not sleeping for 36 hours straight, like my brain, my energy, like nothing could calm down. I had really intense postpartum anxiety and I only understood it after it got better. Also get this question all the time. What double stroller did you use? We have the Bugaboo Donkey 3 that's like for our everyday use. And we have a Mountain Buggy Nano Duo, which is for like quicker trips to throw it in the back of the car super easy um, and for travel because we travel a lot. What is your advice for the first few weeks of having twins? That should be a whole YouTube video. I could do a whole series on it actually. Um, but I will say this like quickly, if your husband or your partner, um, whoever that is, that you're having the babies with, or maybe you're having the babies on your own and you have your mom or someone, your support system, if they can take literally at least two weeks off um, to just get you kind of in the flow. I don't feel like I really got in a flow with tandem feeding until like week two or three. I felt like I really needed support around, I needed hands, I needed help. Um, if you can have support around you for like a minimum of two weeks, I would advise that. In the first couple of months of having twins, you are gonna have an outpouring of people who wanna visit you. Before you have the babies, communicate with your loved ones and your support system and the people that are gonna be coming over to visit you and help with you. Communicate with them exactly what you're gonna need. You can even make a schedule. On Tuesdays, my sister-in-law is going to come over and she's going to do this. Just ask her, do you think you can do that? These visits are going to become more scarce. Like people aren't going to be coming over like they are at first and they do want to help. So don't be afraid to ask them. Communicate before they get there because I'm telling you, when they arrive, you'll feel too awkward to do it. Speaking for communicating what you need with your loved ones, do that with your partner as well. This is so important, you guys. Make sure you're a team and you're not against each other. It's not a competition of who's doing more. Um, try to communicate with your partner, even if it means like having a, an actual to-do list that you know these things need to get done every day. It's going to save a lot of arguing, heartache, resentment in the future if you can get really good at this. So I know this is what everyone's waiting for, the sleep conversation. If I could help a new twin mom with anything, it would be how to get more sleep because it gets really scary for us. So the question is, when did you establish a sleeping schedule? When they're first born, you're more on a feeding schedule than a sleeping schedule. So you're mostly working off a feeding schedule in the beginning. Uh, we implemented a bedtime routine at around seven weeks old. It wasn't because we thought we were, they were gonna sleep through the night, it was to, let the babies understand that we're feeding all around the clock right now, but this feed, the seven or I think when they're newborns, it was later, it was like eight, 9 p.m. This feed is different than all the rest. So it starts to kind of set that time of day apart. Um, and then as they get older and they do establish more adult-like sleeping patterns and they don't have to feed around the clock like they are as newborns, that foundation of that bedtime routine really helps you out later. You can kind of start implementing things to promote a really good sleeping schedule for later, even as early as six weeks old. The next question uh, just leads right off the back of that. When will I sleep again? When I get these questions, I like I get, first of all, I get PTSD because I am remembering how horrible it was not sleeping. This is the one thing I'm like, no, 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 I need to help everyone with this. Between two and three months, they started doing longer stretches at night. And I remember being like, oh my God, this is amazing. This is so good. Like they slept for five hours straight. Yeah. And then the four month sleep regression hit. It's actually them developing and getting more adult like sleeping rhythms. They become very wakeful throughout the night. So they're not in that deep newborn sleep, like that potato sleep, you know? So they they come out of that like I'm a vegetable type sleep 
to being very wakeful throughout the night like adults. So they're waking eight, nine, 10 times a night, just like we do. It's just that we've trained our bodies to not actually come all the way out of sleep and we can put ourselves back to sleep. So around four months old, they go through this development of more adult-like sleeping rhythms and they don't know how to go back to sleep though is the only problem. For me, that was the hardest phase by far. I mean, they were waking up eight times each throughout the night. I never slept longer than 30 minute intervals for like almost two months. And if you've been through that level of sleep deprivation, it is legitimately torture. It will wreak havoc on your entire life, your mental health, your physical health. My body, everything was declining. I couldn't eat. My milk supply was dropping. Like it took everything out of me during that time. So around four and a half months, we started like researching the shit out of sleep. And we started laying down the bricks. Like we are putting down the foundation blocks because these babies are being sleep trained. We just want to make sure they're ready for it when we do it. Because of course, like every other mom, like I was of course terrified that I was going to traumatize my children and all these horrible things on the internet that people talk about. I was going to be this horrible person to do this. But it was really like a survival technique. Like I had to figure this out because it was not sustainable what was happening. Like it was either sleep train them or admit myself to a mental health facility. Like that's actually how, how bad it felt at the time. It, it took us about two months of research and laying down the foundations before we attempted it. But we attempted it at six months old. It worked literally on night two and night three. That's when I slept again. There is hope, you guys, there is hope. Did you breastfeed? Um, I talk about this a lot on my page as well, and I could dive real deep into this topic. I exclusively breastfed for four and a half months, and I'm so proud of that, of course. We went to the form of checkup, and Brooks had, ha had actually lost weight since his last one, and that is like a big red flag. Like babies should be just like exponentially gaining weight. So that was really scary. Again, we were going through that four month sleep regression. I wasn't sleeping for weeks. I was in a really bad headspace and my physical state was an absolute mess as well. And my supply was diving. My kids weren't getting enough food. So I started supplementing formula at night, like one bottle at night. Um, that was because I didn't think that they were getting enough food, number one. And number two, I was hoping it would help them to sleep better because we were going through like 16 wakings a night. So it was a little bit out of desperation for both of those reasons. It was just this like domino effect. Like as soon as I started supplementing the formula, it was like I started having nipple rejection. Um, Brooks really didn't want to breastfeed at all anymore. I tried to hang on to it for weeks and weeks and weeks. I had worked so hard to establish exclusive breastfeeding, so hard. If anyone else has had babies who started their journey in incubators being tube-fed tube formula, and I, and I, against all odds, I was able to fight my way out of that and exclusively breastfeed them for months, and then all of a sudden it just falls apart. Like, it broke me, it truly broke me. And once I finally made the decision, like, look, this isn't working, let's just formula feed. That decision was so hard to make. I was so hard on myself. But once I made it, it was like the hugest weight was just lifted off my shoulders. And I was able to like truly show up as a better parent in every other capacity because of that. So I've actually gotten this question for as long as I can remember on here. And I have never answered it. But here we are on my YouTube channel and I told you guys I was gonna be way more honest and open on here, so here it is. The question is, how do you keep intimacy alive in your relationship amongst like the chaos of twin parenting? I'm gonna switch to a hot tea because I'm about to spill some. No, I'm kidding. The truth is, it's hard. I try to explain it like this. Basically, I have two children. There's somebody constantly touching me, constantly receiving and giving attention, like literally the entire day. Even at two, over two years old, my sons are freaking all over me, kissing me, licking me, hugging me, like crawling all over me, pulling at my legs. Like it's constant, constant affection. I have no autonomy anymore. My food is theirs. My Everything is theirs. They own me. My affection tank has been filled by like 11 a.m. Even though they're, they're very different kinds of affection, like between you and your husband and between you and your kids, I don't know if your body really gets that. I don't think it can decipher the difference between those two affections. And so what happens is you're filling that love tank and that affection tank all day with your kids. 
and you hit, you literally max out by like 11 a.m. and then you're still giving and receiving all day long with them. And then by the time like they go to sleep, like literally put me in a fucking cubicle. I don't want anyone near me. I don't wanna, I don't need to cuddle with you. I don't need, I don't crave your affection anymore because somebody else already filled that tank. That sounds really horrible, right? Like I get that that sounds horrible, but, but it's not horrible, it's real. And if you don't think it's gonna happen to you, then I hope it doesn't, but even it doesn't matter how in love you are. Like it's crazy, it just happens. You're so overstimulated, you're so touched out. You just don't crave that connection anymore because you've gotten it already all day, every day from your children. What I can say is this, being aware of it is super important. Talking about it, being open with your partner about how you're feeling so that they don't feel rejected by you and they understand like, this is just something I'm going through. This is how I'm feeling. And then figuring out a way to not let this become like your life now and just a habit that you continue on forth with. We have figured out by 9 p.m. the fucking ship has sailed, but our kids still sleep for two hours a day. So nap time on Saturdays and Sundays are like our protected time together where it's only halfway through the day we're not drained and overstimulated and touched out by them like we have a lot of space for each other still at that time of day so that is a compromise that we've made um and there you have it <laughs> so weird like telling people about this and i'm not just telling people about my sex life right now like i'm literally telling everyone so yeah if we don't answer the phone at like 1 30 on a saturday like don't call back okay so Harry's gonna fucking kill me for this. Oh my God. Did you have diastasis recti? I had a lot of questions about like, how did you get the flat tummy, right? Like how did you get the flat tummy after giving birth to the twins? Yes, I did have diastasis recti. I had a severe one, very severe. It was like five to six fingers and it's still one and a half. So it's not fully healed, but it's one hell of an improvement that has to do with understanding that the mummy pooch and the injury of the diastasis recti is just that, it's an injury. Like it wasn't like some magic workout or exercise that I lost fat. If you guys are interested to learn more about that, like please like leave some commentary and um, yeah, I'll definitely try to share lots of information about that. I just feel like this is the perfect freaking question to end this with. When do you have time to edit and upload your content? After they go to sleep at night, like I am editing, voiceovering, I am fine tuning, um, all of those things. And then I try to finish that stuff up in the morning. I'll wake up early, I'll get the caption ready, the tags, all of the info that you guys need. And then I'll usually post around like 9 a.m. or something like that, Sydney time. And yeah, it's a lot. Um, it's the best job ever. I'm so grateful for you guys. YouTube is a whole other ball game. It is so much work and it's kind of was like a daunting task for me to take this on. I'm not gonna lie, I have a lot going on already. <laughs> for all of you that are still here at the end of this video, you have no idea how much it means to me that you guys wanna hear what I have to say. I wish I could literally sit in a room with all of you and just drink tea together and laugh and vent and share stories. The twin mom life is not for everyone. That's why we are the chosen ones, right? And we need each other. So thank you again for watching today and let me know what you guys think in the comments.